Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. We ask for your blessing on our time together. We ask that we would have ears to hear, that we would sit under your word with soft hearts, with wills ready to obey. God, we know that we are desperately in need of you as we come before you, as we come to your word, that we need to be made ready for all that you have for us. Would you do that here this evening? And would you speak through your word in Jesus' name? Amen. This evening's message is titled, I Have a Dream. It is not a reference to Martin Luther King Jr. I do have a mug on my shelf in my office that uh, celebrates the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr. It has a picture of Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, they sort of mixed up Martin Luther, 1517 to 2017, with Martin Luther King Jr. At any rate, somebody printed it somewhere who did not have a historical context for either figure. But uh, <laughs> any rate, we're not talking about either one of those characters. We're talking about Nebuchadnezzar this evening and the dream that he had. Uh, we're looking at Daniel 2 over the next three Sunday nights together. And Daniel 2 is a remarkable portion of your Bible. It outlines for us future world history from 600 B.C. all the way until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it comes through the revelation of God to an ancient pagan king in the form of a dream. Tonight we're covering 18 verses. Uh, the next week we'll examine the dream itself, and the following week we'll work through its interpretation. But there are lessons for us, even tonight, in the setup of the dream for the contrast between the religions of the ancient world and faith in the one true God. And there's a lesson for us in the contrast between the servants of those religions and the servants of Yahweh. Remember, the book of Daniel is something of a theological wrestling match. Is the God of Israel merely a regional deity on a level with other regional deities, sometimes winning and sometimes losing in some cosmic game of the political skirmishes of their devotees, something like gods playing stratego or risk, moving their pieces around the board, and, and sometimes one wins and sometimes the other wins, and the armies that win in political wars obviously are the armies held by the stronger God that day. Is the God of Israel like that? Or does the God of Israel even exist? I mean, puny little Israel was given up without a fight against the mighty Babylonian empire. What Daniel 2 reveals for us is that Yahweh is the only God. He is Israel's God, and He is the God over every empire. He is the God over every nation. He is the God over every individual in all of human history. Let's read together Daniel chapter 2, the first 18 verses. Now, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. The king said to them, I had a dream. And my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell the dream to your servants, and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied to the Chaldeans, The command from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb, and your houses will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and a reward and great honor. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell the dream to his servants and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time, inasmuch as you have seen that the command from me is firm, that if you do not make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation is changed. Therefore, tell me the dream that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who could declare the matter for the king. Inasmuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult. 
And there is no one else who could declare it to the king except God's, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. Because of this, the king became indignant and very furious and gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. Then Daniel replied with discretion and discernment to Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard, who had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He said to Arioch, the king's commander, For what reason is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch informed Daniel about the matter. So Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, about the matter, so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. What we see in this text tonight is that God unveils his plan for world history and at the same time exposes the poverty of Babylonian religion. God, through Nebuchadnezzar's dream, is going to tell us what's going to happen through the succession of world empires until Jesus Christ reigns on the earth. And he's going to show us that the Babylonian religions are empty. And we'll just walk through this narrative through uh, several scenes. The first one is that the king is undone by a dream. This is the first three verses. Now, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar literally dreamed dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. The king gave orders to call in the magicians, conjurers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. The king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Verse 1 tells us this is the second year of his reign. You might be thinking, wait a second. Uh, there were three years of training. How is this in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign? Um, remember that the reignal years in Babylonian accounting were different. Uh, the first year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign wasn't counted. That's the accession year. The second year of his reign is actually the first full year according to calendar. And so it is possible to see the third year of training finishing up in Nebuchadnezzar's second year. It's really been the third year he's been around, the third year that Daniel's been there. One possibility is that Nebuchadnezzar's dream happens in the middle of Daniel and his friends training, but I like to think of this as chronological from chapter 1 to chapter 2, so that the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign is the third year of Daniel's time in Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar says that he dreamed dreams, his spirit was disturbed. Literally, the Hebrew text is his, his spirit struck itself over and over again. And it was said here that his sleep left him, or, or maybe even possibly his sleep was against him. Nebuchadnezzar was so disturbed by this dream, probably a recurring dream, that he could not sleep. And notice in verse 2, the king orders the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. He calls in everybody who could possibly interpret what is this dream all about. And his first command to them is, tell me my dreams. The magicians there are the experts in sacred documents, the scholars of Babylonian religion. The conjurers are the exorcists, those who use spells and incantations to speak and communicate with spirits. The sorcerers are those pr practitioners of witchcraft, casting spells and calling up the dead. And then the Chaldeans are the diviners of signs and omens and dreams. They're the ones that read the flocks of birds and tell you what's going to happen next. They're also the scientists of the land. So the Chaldeans was the generic term for probably the whole class of wise guys in Babylon. They were the ones who studied astronomy. In fact, uh, John Whitcomb points out that one of these Chaldeans, Naburamanu, in 500 BC was able to calculate the length of a year at 365 days, 6 hours, 15 minutes, and 41 seconds. He was only 26 minutes off. Pretty remarkable ability. So they weren't just all weirded out on astrology. They actually studied astronomy as well. These were the smart men of Babylon. And, and Babylon, again, was the center of education in the ancient world. This was the height of human achievement and learning. And all of the best of the best stood before him, verse 2. 
The New American Standard Bible gives a heading for chapter 2 called The King's Forgotten Dream. I don't believe the king's dream was forgotten. I think the king is withholding information about the dream so that he can know whether or not his smartest guys actually have the right interpretation. The idea of a forgotten dream comes from the the old English translations that missed a word that we didn't quite have the definition to. Uh, We have a better understanding of the language here now. And the idea is not that Nebuchadnezzar forgot his dream. He was quite aware of what his dream was but he was testing his smartest guys. And there's a reason for that we'll see as the text unfolds. Notice in verse 3, the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is anxious to understand it. How troubled must Nebuchadnezzar have been by this dream? This was no ordinary dream. He didn't wake up every night and wonder, oh, I'm just curious about all the images that went through my head through the night. This was unusual. He assembled all the wise guys of his realm We know, of course, that this dream is from Yahweh, the God of Israel. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know that, and God is setting Nebuchadnezzar up to acknowledge the one true God. Despite Nebuchadnezzar's assumption that his gods must have been superior to Israel's gods because we so easily conquered Israel. The next section of our text shows us that the wise guys of Babylon are squirming. They're not going to be comfortable here under the king's command. They're in a pickle. Look at verse 4. The Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. And by the way, from this point on all the way to the end of chapter 7, the text of our Bible is written in Aramaic, the the language of the land of Babylon at that time. Their scholarly language would have been in Akkadian, but everybody spoke Aramaic. And so Daniel's text is in Aramaic, Aramaic as well. And it begins, O king, live forever. This is a claim of loyalty. You see, in the ancient world, it's very common for a king to be toppled by political intrigue even within the palace. They wanted to say out loud, we're not conspirators. We, your nearest advisors, want you to keep on living and living and living. Of course, it was an empty claim. It was a meaningless formality because Nebuchadnezzar, like all earthly kings, would die. This portends disaster for Nebuchadnezzar, and he wants to know what it is about. This dream, this big statue, it it gets smashed. Is this some sort of omen that signifies the end of my career? And all these guys around me, are they conspiring against me? They cry out, O king, live forever. Tell the dream, and we will tell you the interpretation. They said, we got this. This is in our wheelhouse. We've studied these things. We, we have actually written the books on dream interpretation. You can still go and find the, the books of ancient Babylon on dream interpretation. And they had lists of dreams and lists of the interpretations appropriate to the dreams. The scholars were the ones who held the books. And their explanations of dreams would have been convincing to the uneducated. People would have been impressed when the experts told you what your dreams meant. In seventh grade, I considered myself an expert on baseball card values. I had the Beckett Guide. The Beckett Guide would tell you, uh, what is this card? What year is it? Who is this guy? And what condition is the card in? Are the corners frayed? Is it fuzzy? Does it have a crease in it? Or is it in mint condition? And it just tells you the values. You could look up this grid and you can find out what that card should cost. And then you could be the expert and you could negotiate prices with trades and deals. And for the uninitiated or for the sorry saps who bought baseball cards at the Circle K and didn't have the Beckett Guide, you could make some money. Nebuchadnezzar's different here. You know, the, 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 the Chaldeans are saying, tell me what baseball card you have and we'll tell you what it's worth. Nebuchadnezzar says, you tell me what baseball card I have. That's a different challenge. And the Beckett Guide's not going to help you. The the dream interpretation books are not going to have the answer to Nebuchadnezzar's demand. This is a pickle. Look at verse 5. The king replied to the Chaldeans, The command from me is firm. It's certain. It is sure. Make known to me the dream and the interpretation or else. And look at the or else here. You will be torn limb from limb. This comes up several times in the book of Daniel. That's just a... An interesting or else, is it not? 
I mean, we're just we're going to rip your arms off. We're going to remove your legs from you. Literally, the text here says, we will make limbs of you. And this was a regular practice. Uh, noted in Persian empires and Babylonian empires and in the realms of ancient Mesopotamia, removing somebody's limbs was just something that was done. And notice the second part of the or else. Your houses will be turned to rubbish heaps. That is, your homes will be torn down, then we'll pile trash on them, and we might even make them a dunghill. Take all of our refuse and just pile it up on where you used to live. This or else would affect the families of the wise guys as well. It would affect their name, their progeny. This was no idle threat, by the way. Of course, an ancient Near Eastern tyrant could do whatever he wanted to do. And Nebuchadnezzar himself had done some things. 2 Kings 25.7 tells us that Nebuchadnezzar had the sons of Zedekiah slaughtered before his very eyes and then had his eyes put out before putting him in chains and dragging him off to Babylon. So what is the last thing Zedekiah sees? His own sons being slain. And Jeremiah 29.22 also mentions Nebuchadnezzar. And it talks about the, the curse of those who are uh, the exiles in Judah. They would lay upon somebody who uh, they disliked. May you be like Zedekiah, different Zedekiah, and Ahab, two youths whom King Nebuchadnezzar roasted in the fire. So for Nebuchadnezzar to say to his wise guys, I'll tear your limbs apart and we'll make your homes a rubbish heap. They knew he meant it and he had the power to do it. Look at verse 6, here's the contrast. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and a reward and great honor. I, I think the first would be incentive enough. I don't know why you need the double incentive. Uh, but certainly this would appeal to the wise guys in Babylon who were used to palace life and privilege and a posh lifestyle and the best of the nation. But this was an all or nothing game. To, to live in the palace in Babylon had its perks, but it came at great risk. This is high stakes in the upper crust of Babylonian society. And look at verse 7. They answered a second time, and they said, Let the king tell the dream to his servants, and we will declare the interpretation. And you can hear that they are desperate at this point. They're on dangerous ground now because they're repeating exactly what they said in verse 4. Listen, you did not want to be in the palace of a king. You would not want to be in the king's hearing and have audience in his presence where you get limited words and you got to be on your P's and Q's and then say the same thing twice. The king would lose his patience with such insolence. Now, these guys are in trouble. And so we see in verses 8 to 11, the next scene, the jig is up. The, the game is over for them. By the way, the, the jig is up. We use that phrase. It comes from the Elizabethan area, uh, 1600s. And uh, a jig was a joke. And uh, if you were pulling a prank or telling a joke or working out a practical joke and somebody said your jig is up, that means we see through you, the game is over, and now you're done. And, and that is certainly true here for the wise men of Babylon. Look at verse 8. The king replied, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time. Literally, you're buying time. Inasmuch as you have seen that the command from me is firm. And verse 9, if you don't make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you. What is that one decree? A painful death and humiliations galore. King Nebuchadnezzar sees through them. He says, you have agreed together, lying in corrupt words. Nebuchadnezzar knows that they are conspiring at this point. They're, they're talking with each other. How do we get out of a jam? Say anything. What's it going to take for us together to get out of this pickle that we're in? Corrupt words. They're, these are lies, and Nebuchadnezzar sees through them. They're being exposed, literally, until time changes for itself. Until the situation has changed, says Nebuchadnezzar. They're thinking, well, if we hold out long enough, we stay our own execution, 
And we can keep our limbs for a little bit longer. Maybe the king will forget. Maybe he'll have a different dream. Maybe he'll get distracted. Maybe he'll just cool off. We need to stall for time. Nebuchadnezzar knows exactly what they are doing. And he says, therefore, tell me the dream. Again, why is Nebuchadnezzar demanding the dream? Because the only way that he can be sure that they are truly interpreting the dream is if they reveal the contents of the dream. Their textbook answers to dream interpretation might fool the uneducated, but remember that Nebuchadnezzar is himself a Chaldean. He's the son of Nabopolassar. Nabopolassar was the Chaldean. The, the Chaldeans racially were the, the people of southern Babylon who took over the Babylonian empire and then ruled it. It was the Chaldeans at the helm of the Babylonian empire that brought Neo-Babylonia to its new greatness. It was the Chaldeans at the helm who saw the end of the mighty Assyrian empire. It was the Chaldeans at the helm of Babylon who brought about the Babylonian Empire covering all of Palestine, all of Egypt, and ruling over everything the Assyrian Empire had ruled. The, Chalde the word Chaldeans originally meant those, those science magicians. It eventually came to mean all of the wise guys. Nebuchadnezzar had his roots in those, that Chaldean history of science and astronomy and astrology, and he knew their tricks. He knew their books. He saw through their lies. And Nebuchadnezzar knew that they had books for the interpretations of dreams. He would have been well-versed in their methods. Do you remember the scene in The Wizard of Oz when the four people are there and there's the scary face and the loud voice and the weird green pipe organ and then the curtain is drawn? Never mind that man behind the curtain. Nebuchadnezzar knew that there was no Wizard of Oz behind the Babylonian religion. It, it was a guy with tricks and chicanery behind a curtain. He wasn't fooled by it. He needed more than their books and their tricks to understand his dream. And this dream was so disturbing that he wanted an answer, demanded an answer. And make no mistake, this dream was from Yahweh. What is going on in this scene? Clearly, Yahweh is driving history. The one true God is driving the narrative. You see, Nebuchadnezzar was a skilled statesman, statesman, an accomplished general. He valued having skilled and wise people around him. He stashed away the most promising youth of the nations he conquered in order to train them under the best education to make them useful in the service of his empire. This was not a, a narcissistic tyrant infatuated with his own ideas, building a small yes-men core of sycophants. This was a guy who wanted to manage a large empire well. So what would drive him to annihilate all the wise men of his realm? Clearly something that transcended normal experience. Nebuchadnezzar's at the end of himself because of this dream. He wants answers, and nothing will satisfy him except the true interpretation of this heaven-sent dream. Political intrigue, the ascendancy of rival empires, the threat of plots and conspiracies, maybe an assassination attempt from the inner ranks. These are all things that would have been suspicions in Nebuchadnezzar's mind. Are these the things that the dream portends for me? This supernatural dream that seems to signify the end of his reign. Nebuchadnezzar wants to know what is going on. Now look at verse 10. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who could declare the matter for the king, inasmuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. Moreover, the thing is difficult, and there's no one who could declare it except gods, and their place is not with mortal flesh. Here is their string of excuses. This, by the way, is a frank admission. Here are the Babylonian wise guys, the religious leaders, the priestly class, are confessing that they have nothing. They are saying to the king, we really can't do the things that we've claimed to be capable of. If you were to give an illusionist a normal hat and no rabbit... 
Could he pull a rabbit out of the hat? No. He, he is totally dependent on his own sleight of hand, his own hat with a secret trap door and the rabbit up his sleeve or wherever it is. You give an illusionist a normal hat and he's not doing magic. And notice their excuses. You can't expect us to tell you what you dreamed, king. Here's their first excuse. Number one, no man on earth could declare that. Are they right? Sort of right. But as the narrative plays out, they're going to be dead wrong. Daniel will. Now, Daniel's going to tell the king up front, no man can do this. But the God of heaven reveals mysteries. And Daniel tells him the dream. So, a man on earth did actually declare Nebuchadnezzar's dream because Yahweh revealed it. By the way, this, this statement, no man on earth could declare that, it's actually a lie. It's a lie. They don't know that. And do you know the kind of lie that pretends omniscience? Right? You, you assume you know everything, and therefore you make this universal declaration that such and such could not possibly be true because I know everything. That's an arrogant assumption. Just because you don't know that anyone could tell the dream, or you can't imagine how it could be done, doesn't mean that it can't be done. That is the lie that assumes that I know what can be known. And listen, unless our information comes from God, unless we have a dependent epistemology, I know truth because I got it from God who is truth. Unless our knowledge starts there, we are so arrogant to claim knowledge that something exists or doesn't exist. We have no ground for that. We have no ground for the, the quality or the extent of our knowledge. Such a claim is an arrogant lie. No man could tell you that. And what do these guys know? The second excuse, no great, no great king has ever asked this. This is flattery and an insult. The flattery is this way, O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, we think you are great, so don't ask us, because great kings don't do that. The insult is this, Nebuchadnezzar, if you were truly great, you wouldn't be asking this of us. But Nebuchadnezzar doesn't fall for it. He doesn't fall for their flattery, doesn't get blitzed by their insult. He doesn't think to himself, you know what? I want them to think I'm great, so I better stop asking. If I'm going to maintain my reputation in front of them, they think that only great kings don't ask this kind of stuff. I want them to think I'm great, so I'm going to stop asking. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't do that. Look at verse 11. This is excuse number three. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult. That's hard. Well, then, what good was all your training and dream interpretation, you knuckleheads? You spend your whole life telling the whole world that you can interpret dreams. Now, the king has a dream, and it's really bothering him, and he's asking you to give the interpretation, and you can't do it. And all of a sudden, you're saying it's hard? Excuse number four, and, and, and this is the really big theological home run here. <laughs> Only gods to, could declare this. <laughs> Only gods can declare this kind of thing. And by the way, they're not here. They don't dwell with mortal flesh. Now, wh what would you think of your priestly class at this point? The people that head up the whole department of religion. Well, then where is Marduk? Where is Bel? Where are the 50 other Babylonian gods in this pantheon? What have I been spending all our tax money on? Oh, well, this temple we're sitting in here, dedicated to Marduk, you're saying he's not here, he doesn't care, he can't tell you the dream? What are you guys doing? You're priests. Don't you talk to him? Doesn't he tell you stuff? I mean, what are we doing here? <laughs> this is remarkable. They are confessing in this moment <laughs> that they're incapable of doing what their whole enterprise was about. And their claim to have access to the spiritual realm is worthless. I mean, they're criminals. They're frauds. They're worthless. 
For a time so important as this, why do we even have these guys? This set of excuses is insolence before the king. I mean, he could just delimb them right there. These wise men are accustomed to privilege, but they know this is the end. This is their last shot, and they are desperate. This is a remarkable admission from men who devoted their entire lives to their training and their entire existence to this idolatrous religious servitude. By the way, this is one of the dark, cruel plots of Satan, uh, the, the invention of human religion. Have you ever thought about this? The, the, the systems of human religion that just call men to work, 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 dress up in funny clothes, um, sacrifice common grace gifts of your creator, just give them up in, in devotion to this emptiness, perform empty religious ceremonies without ever pleasing God, searing and soothing your conscience without ever cleansing it, piling up offenses against God while providing no power over sin. What a dark deception. Thinking about Roman Catholicism and the calls to celibacy, penance, meritorious works, no meat on Fridays. I mean, that is a sacrifice for nothing. Latin masses, I mean, going to church day after day after day and not understanding what's going on. Stand up, sit down, blah, 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 leave. Thinking you've done something for God. Endless, mindless rosaries. All that work, the theft of common joys, for what? Only judgment in the end for self-righteousness. Empty religion. Think about Islam. What do you got to do to get to heaven? Oh, keep the five pillars. Have you done it? Ah, uh, no. But I'm trying and I hope Allah is merciful. Have you done your alms all the time? Oh, not very well. Have you done the pilgrimage? Nope. Five times daily prayers toward Mecca. Yeah, I do that. Did you do it yesterday? Well, not yesterday. <laughs> Jihad? What about martyrdom? Go and blow yourself up. A bunch of other innocent parties. For what? To lead this life and to face your maker and only receive judgment. What a wicked darkness. Scott Demarest and I years ago took a trip to Western China and experienced Tibetan Buddhism. Dark. Prayer wheels, prayer flags, always spinning, always flapping in the breeze, doing this mechanical thing for the worshipers. If the prayer wheel spins, that means prayers are happening. I'm not saying anything. I don't know what's being said, but that's how the gods are pleased. So I, I got to walk down this hall and spin these wheels and keep them spinning, walk back down the hall and then start over again and spin the wheels. I got to take this little thing and spin it so that the thing goes around so that prayers are happening and the gods are pleased. I don't know what's being said, but I just got to do it and do it and do it. All the mechanisms. The dark temples with the awful smelling yak butter candles, acrid smoke filling their sanctuaries. Because the smoke going up feeds the gods and, and you got to keep burning the candles to feed the gods. In Tibetan Buddhism, you, you give your son to the temple to be a monk when he's a boy. And that's your worship to the gods. That's your sacrifice and it earns you points, maybe advancement, you hope. But you've given up your son. And, and what does the Tibetan Buddhist system do with your son? Train him to be a monk. Rob him of earthly joys and consign him as a victim to the most well-organized, protected, and admired system of sexual abuse on the planet. Every boy in that system is a victim and then becomes a perpetrator against other victims in a perpetual cycle of wickedness. It is so dark. It is so evil. And they dress it up in the orange robes and the purple robes and Westerners look at that stuff and think it's cool. It's wicked. In Nebuchadnezzar's court in the heart of Babylon, with all the best representatives of Babylon's religion and worldview present, 
the Babylonian religion is exposed. It's a vanity, it's emptiness. Isaiah, a century before, talked about Babylon this way. Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh silver on the scale, they hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a god. They bow down. Indeed, they worship it. They lift it upon the shoulder and they carry it. They set it in its place and it stands there. It does not move from its place. Though one may cry to it, it cannot answer. It cannot deliver him in his distress. In Isaiah 47, God speaks to Babylon through Isaiah. Stand fast now in your spells and in your many sorceries with which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you may cause trembling. You are wearied with your many counsels. Now, let the astrologers, those who prophesy by the stars, let those who predict by the new moons, let them stand up and save you from what will come upon you. Behold, they have become like stubble. They're nothing. Isaiah 46, 9. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, says Yahweh declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times those things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. There's the God who accurately records the past and accurately records the future. And in the next verse, he says, Cyrus is coming to destroy Babylon. Two centuries before it happened. The Babylonian religion is exposed. Its priests are frauds. It has nothing to offer. It is a slavery to emptiness. And this cruel joke of Satan's human religions should make all of us indignant. The empty superstitions of Babylon's religions made Nebuchadnezzar, the king, indignant. Look at the next verse, verse 12. The king is done. Because of this, the king became indignant and very furious. He became angry and wroth, says the Old English. He was furious and very angry to a very great degree. And he ordered the death of all the wise men of Babylon. Again, Nebuchadnezzar was a wise general, a shrewd manager, an astute and ambitious king. He's going to kill all of his best. Is this merely irrational? Is he like Rehoboam, consumed in his youth with his own infatuation and his own zeal for his own pleasure, and he's going to get all the junior hires around him to tell him how to rule the nation? Or is he like Nero? I don't believe so. I do believe Nebuchadnezzar was a, an astute, wise, shrewd, and evil king. But this circumstance is from Yahweh, the God of Israel, and he will not let Nebuchadnezzar go. Verse 13, so the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. The participle here for uh, the decree went out uh, for uh, the next word is slaying for themselves, the wise men. And that participle there can be taken to mean uh, that they are intending to massacre all the wise men, or they are starting to massacre all the wise men, or they were massacring all the wise men. And then the last sentence, they sought to slay Daniel and his companions as well. So either the massacre has started or it's in process or it's about to start and and they're looking for Daniel. Why are Daniel and his friends not with all the wise men assembled? Well, perhaps simply because Daniel's not one of the magicians, conjurers, sorcerers, or Chaldeans. He's a Hebrew, having been trained in the Babylonian ways, but but he's not any one of those categories, neither Azariah, Mishael, or, or Hananiah. They're in a separate class. It's also possible that they were still in their training and wouldn't have risen to the level of the others yet. It's also possible that they were in different housing because of their special diet and their separatedness. But of course, they're still considered part of the wise men, this collective of all that need to be annihilated in Babylon, and they are marked out for death as well. This leads us to the last scene in verse 14, Daniel intercedes. Daniel intercedes at several levels with Arioch, with Nebuchadnezzar, with his own friends, and finally with the God of heaven. Look at his intercession with Arioch in verse 14. 
Daniel replied with discretion and discernment to Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard, who had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. And he said to Arioch, the king's commander, For what reason is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch informed Daniel about the matter. Here we see classic Daniel. He goes to the, the captain of the bodyguard with counsel and discretion. Literally, Daniel caused to go forth counsel and good taste. He has discretion. He, he speaks appropriately with Arioch. And, and Arioch, it, it's just a name here in our text, but, but look at his title. He is captain of the bodyguard. He is the chief guardsman. And the word for guard here comes from a root which actually means to slay. He is slayer. Captain slayer. He is the chief executioner. This would be a rough dude. This guy's job was to put to death the king's enemies. That's his nine to five. His task here was to see that all the wise men of Babylon were executed, and he knocks on Daniel's door. Verse 15, Daniel asks him, why is the decree so urgent? Why is it literally being harsh? Why this brutality? And then Arioch informed Daniel about the matter. What does this rough executioner, chief slayer doing letting Daniel even speak. Now, what's going on here? Arioch not only entertained Daniel's question, but then actually explained what was going on. Apparently, Daniel has a good rapport with Arioch. Daniel answers with wisdom and discretion, but ultimately what's going on here, Daniel has received favor from the Lord. God is orchestrating these things and put a guy in place who would normally just de-limb you, lop off your head, and turn your house into a rubbish heap. And he's having a conversation with one marked out for execution. Daniel then intercedes with Nebuchadnezzar, and nothing is told how Daniel gets audience with the king. Uh, Does Daniel just walk in? And may we learn from chapter 1 that the king was impressed with Daniel at the end of his training. And verse 16 tells us that Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. And the king granted Daniel's request. Daniel's faith here, I do not believe, is presumption. I don't think Daniel is saying, I just got to stay execution. I got to say anything that comes to mind to just buy a little more time. He's not like the Chaldeans. Look back at chapter 1 and verse 17. Remember these four youths during their training, God gave them knowledge, intelligence, and every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. What's happening here? God had prepared Daniel for this moment. Just like Joseph, when Joseph was able to interpret the baker and the cupbearer's dreams in preparation for their ability to tell the Pharaoh that he could interpret dreams... Apparently here, Daniel was able to interpret dreams ahead of this crisis and had the confidence to go before Nebuchadnezzar and say, God's going to give you the interpretation, give me time. Now, what does Daniel need time for? We find out in the next verse, to pray. Daniel's not presumptuous here. He's confident that the Lord has set him up for this moment. God has demonstrated some of the purpose for Daniel receiving interpretations of dreams prior. But then Daniel just doesn't start Spilling things here, he's going to go pray. He's going to seek favor from the Lord. Again here, Daniel has been given wisdom and discretion and favor from God. And then in verse 17, he intercedes with his friends. They seem to be living in the same quarters. Daniel went to his house and informed his friends. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are there. And he informs them about the matter so that, verse 18, they might request compassion. Daniel goes to his friends, and they pray. Imagine these teens getting together in this crisis. What should we do? They go to God. Verse 18, this is their intercession. To request compassions, plural, from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. 
And the God of heaven is a key phrase here. It's used in contrast to the gods of the Babylonian pantheon. The God of heaven means he is the God over the sun and the moon and the stars. And he's asking that they not be destroyed. Now let's consider Daniel for just a few moments as we close. Daniel met Arioch, the chief executioner at the door. When that guy comes to your door, what would you do? Daniel with courage, resolve, trust, composure. Remember, Daniel is on the side of truth. Daniel knows that God is his judge. It's embedded in his name. And he has nothing else to fear. What had Daniel learned from the prophet Isaiah? If you fear the Lord, you are in a right relationship with the biggest and the scariest. Nothing's bigger than Yahweh, nothing's scarier than Yahweh. And so to trust yourself in him means you need fear nothing else. And so he can answer with composure and wisdom and tact. He apparently had a good reputation. He was courageous. And in the end, what's going on here? Daniel received favor from the Lord. Righteous men with courage and composure do die. (laughs) Daniel's life could have ended here. Consider what kind of friends you have for a moment. Daniel had three friends in this narrative. What did they do? They prayed. What did the Babylonians do? They they went to their friends to conspire to lie. Daniel went to his friends to gather to pray. Do you have those kind of friends in your life? Do you have the kind of friends that are going to get squirmy and try to figure out some fleshly solution to some problem? Do you have friends that are going to try to get you out of trials or friends that are going to go to the God who brings them into your life for his purposes? Daniel went to his friends and they gathered and they prayed. Final thing to consider here is, is what is what is God doing in this story? God is proving God is proving something about himself. He's proving something about the Babylonian gods. He's proving something about Babylonian religion. God is putting on display the reality that the Babylonian religions are phony. Their gods are nothings and their servants are fools. Just wait. Every false way will one day be similarly exposed. Think about this, Nebuchadnezzar did not fear offending the priestly class of the Babylonian religions. He knew that the Wizard of Oz was just a frenetic man behind a curtain. He knew that their religions were empty superstitions. He knew that they could not answer his fundamental question, and Daniel feared something scarier than offending the priests of Babylon. Listen, the the, the priests of religions can sometimes hold the kings under their sway by saying, I saw this omen, and if you don't do what we say, you're going to be in trouble. Not Nebuchadnezzar. He saw something from the Lord of the universe that caused him to outfear his Babylonian priestly class. Dale Ralph Davis says this, How easy is it to terrify strong men outside of Christ? The dream itself was scary. Nebuchadnezzar was no nitwit. He knew that the massive metallic monster had to represent something, maybe his own kingdom, and he knew that the stone brought catastrophe to it. He's the king of Babylon, and he's shaking as he unbuttons his PJs in the morning. By the way, if you've never read anything by Dale Ralph Davis, you should. God's people needed to see this scene. Israel needed to see the exposure of the emptiness of Babylonian religion. It is what they had been whoring after for so many centuries. And we need to see this. Our God will dispense with empires. Our God will lay low every phony religion. God will one day expose everything we've set our hearts on opposed to Him as the emptinesses they always were. And we need to remember that a tyrant with unlimited earthly power can be upended by a little 
dream. Let's pray. God, thank you for this chapter, for the setup of the dream that you gave Nebuchadnezzar that will tell us what happens with the rest of the world. We look forward to hearing about that dream and its interpretation. More than that, we look forward to seeing its fulfillment when your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes and smashes that metallic monster, sets up his kingdom on the earth, vindicates his own name, and makes everything right. Lord Jesus, may you have your day come quickly.